so perhaps we can uh, we can start. Well, thank you so much for um, everybody attending this webinar today. Uh, we have uh, many participants from um, many parts of the world. So thank you so much for uh, uh, for your attention. Uh, just a legal notice: uh, this webinar is recorded. Uh, let me first introduce. Um, um, to you, our distinguished speakers. Uh, Luca Davino. Luca Davino has 25 years of experience in the industry. He has worked at JP Morgan Milan office since uh, 2006. He is responsible for the wealth advisory practice for the private bank in Italy. Uh, Luca advises clients on, a, on asset detention strategies generational planning subjects and family business reorganizations. He also serves as president of the Wealth Advisory Commission at the Italian Private Banking Association. Richard Giangrande. Richard is a partner with McFarland's LLP in London. Richard specializes in UK tax and estate planning for private clients. As many of his clients are internationally, are international. He regularly assists clients moving between jurisdictions or considering the interaction between UK and other tax regimes. I am Stefano Guizzo Galizai. I'm a partner with Nunziante Magrone in Milano. I have more than 30 years of experience in corporate and international tax matters, including private clients. And I am admitted to practice law both, both in Italy and in California. Most of my practice is international in scope. Um, uh, I have um, to put matters in perspective, I think it will be um, interesting to start uh, to understand um, um, A, what, what are the main reasons that motivate high net worth individuals to relocate internationally? And um, what are the most common departing and arriving countries? And uh, this is, will be interesting to understand both from a private banker perspective and from a, an attorney uh, perspective. Uh, so first, the uh, private banker perspective. Luca, from your view, what are the main drivers for high net worth individuals to relocate internationally? And, and, and what do you perceive are the most common countries uh, of origin and destination? Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, and a good evening all. Well, coming, coming immediately to, to, to your question, um, let, me, let me have a, a very quick preamble. Um, we at JP Morgan are assessing this trend of global relocation of ultra net worth individuals and are using a variety of sources internal independent sources and also internal service across our wealth advisory network. In that perspective, um, Stefano will, will show you some, some material that will help me uh, walk you through the key findings of this, of this, uh, of this review or this activity that, that, uh, that we made on, on this topic. And um, so, um, Stefano, I'm not sure if you are, if you are meanwhile showing the, the, the material uh, in, case, in case I can stop speaking, let me know. Okay. Well, um, so we, we found some highlights on this global trend because the first thing to put into perspective, this is a global trend and actually um you you can um, you can can imagine people relocating around the world first thing moved by several drivers often in combination and um i'm just waiting thanks Stephen. um several driving often in combination uh 
over last years, the first point that we want to highlight is that acquiring an alternative residence or citizenship in alternative jurisdiction became a trend, as I told you. Many individuals, in particular, for fastest growing markets, increasingly move to other countries, other jurisdictional. And I told you, I, I told you that there are drivers behind this trend, which often are in combination. Business, education, career for those who are managers, and obviously also investment appetite, and also tax reasons. So on the wave of this trend, new programs to attract wealthy individuals have been developing around the world. And the trend in the last three years in particular, reach the critical mass. And now we consider this a standard consideration. Initially, like in music, initially, you have new songs then become classics after some years. So this is now becoming a classic standard consideration for international high net worth individuals looking to hedge volatility and create short-term value as long as well as long-term hedging through mobility. For international investors, having options uh, like those has become an essential part of any families. You see, you can read insurance policy, meaning hedging policy. And the migration volumes of uh, 2020, that decline, 2020, that decline because of COVID, obviously, doesn't break this trend. We think, in fact, that once COVID pandemic situation will be off, when things normalize, the trend will continue unchanged and probably will increase. Client advisors, this is the key message that we at JP Morgan, working as wealth advisors, have found that cooperation is, is, is key. Cooperation between clients, bankers, and advisors of the clients, where those advisors can be lawyers, tax advisors, trustees, and so on. In fact, we have also analyzed at JP Morgan certain fails. The discussion fails when there is no cooperation, when someone in, in around the table go, goes over his job, when the banker wants to work as an advisor and when the, the attorney or the advisor thanks Stefano you can you can stay you can stay on page three when the advisor uh, wants to uh, to advise the client on investment matters instead the most successful cases are those where cooperations and partnership across the table with the client works well Appreciate this, this few, these few topics can be summarized in three points. This is a global trend. COVID is not impacting it on a long-term perspective. And we, this, this, this conclusion comes from the many conversation that you are, we are still having now during COVID in video call, video conferences. Actually, we also performed some internal surveys Obviously, this is not scientific, but give us the, 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 the feeling and a good impression of what, what's going on on this topic. And we see that the number of conversation is, is increasing, although the number of moves is obviously decreasing, given the, the situation. Now, focusing on what are the factors, because at the beginning, I, I, I wanted to remark that, that there are several factors driving the client choice. And so again, combining the findings out of our internal service with client and prospects and the scientific analysis that you can find on page six, some sources if you want to deepen this topic, are, are four. Country risk related factors. So obviously without without looking at any single countries, but we can appreciate the clients in certain countries perceive certain country risk of any 
of any form, stability, stability of low political stability, a potential increase of taxes changes uh, foreseen in taxation or law. And you, you see in, in the slide four drivers, the first one being country risk related, country risk related factor, the second being tax related, because we, we need to be aware that tax is a main concern when you move to another to another country, since most of these are ultra INET or individual. Work related, this is mainly really mainly regarding uh, top managers, private equity partners. To give you a, a live example, uh, two days ago I was in a conversation with a client of ours who is a private equity top 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 player who is considering uh, uh, relocating to another country. Work related, so can be when managers uh, in, in certain sectors do not forget entertainment. There are famous sportsmen who have enjoyed, for example, the relocation regime in Italy as well. And family reasons. Family reasons should not be underestimated because in many circumstances, the clients uh, look to other country in order to offer different educational system, different perspective, and so to leverage, uh, to leverage mobility in such a way. I, I will stop my, my speech so far later on. Just last point, I want to highlight that one of the topics that we have done through our service and through external independent material is what are the most frequent exit countries and most frequent uh, goal um, destination countries. And you see on that page that obviously for from fastest growing markets, Asia, Russia, India, and so on, official numbers from international agencies and matches also our evidence. There is a consistent and global trend. While in terms of destination country, you can see that uh, across uh, the word USA, Australia, and some other countries which are not colored on the map, but Cyprus, Greece, Italy, are observing, we are observing an increasing interest in, in that countries in light of the special regimes. So I, I, will, I will enter later in some additional aspect because uh, it, it makes sense that I offer you not the attorney or tax advisor perspective, but what are the, 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 the key points that we touch with other, our clients when we prepare them to discuss with the, 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 the specialized advisor on relocation regime in order for them to get to the best of those advisors. So at this stage, I would, I would, uh, I move back to, 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 to Stefano and uh, I, will, I will enter later on. On, on some additional aspects on this trend. Uh, thank you, Luca. That's very interesting. And, and I see from your slide that France is one of the most frequent uh, exit countries. And uh, given that France is a very stable country politically and uh, has a very high standard of living, I take from that that uh, very high transfer and inherited um, uh, taxes uh, do play a role in that. Um, in any event, uh, so uh, Richard, uh, from uh, the attorney perspective, what are the push and pull factors that motivate uh, high net worth individuals to relocate? Well, th thank you, Stefano and Luca. It's a very interesting hearing Luca's experience from a private banker perspective, because I think we see very similar trends. And I'm just going to focus today on, on, on how those trends look specifically from a tax and legal perspective. But I think we, we, we are seeing very similar things in the market, I think it's fair to say. I'm just going to share my slides, which hopefully everybody will be able to see. And this, this first slide here um, is, is just looking really at the, at the push factors. And, and again, it ties in very closely with what Luca was just saying about jurisdictions people are considering moving from, and it, France appears on this list. Um, one thing that I think really bothers our clients is the risk of changes in tax rules, resulting in them losing significant amounts or maybe you know, losing part of their business um, uh, in an unexpected way. 
And so I think in recent years, we've seen clients very closely watching tax developments in different jurisdictions. Um, taking the UK for, you know, for, as an example, in, in, I mean, obviously we, we've had a, a degree of um, uh, a less settled period because of the Brexit vote in 2016, which made the UK a slightly interesting place to, to, to invest for a while. Um, in the run-up to the 2019 general election, our main opposition party was putting forward very um, uh, putting forward tax policies, which were seen by some as being quite confiscatory, and, and and that made the UK probably less attractive for a period. Um, and similarly, there was a lot of concern going into the into the um, uh, early this year um, talk of increases in capital gains tax rates. So we see clients watching that, and I think in this period where clients are perhaps more able to move between jurisdictions, or it's become more common to do so. Clients keep a very close eye on what's happening. Um, similarly, I'm increasingly receiving inquiries at the moment from US clients or US lawyers who are concerned about tax changes under the new administration in the US. Now, the US is a very interesting example because of the, the worldwide taxation of US citizens. So it tends to be much harder for US citizens to essentially escape global US taxation. Um, but certainly non-citizen residents of the US, you know, that might be uh, relevant too. And also, you know, one hears US citizens talking about expatriation. So, you know, that is also not unheard of. And then very much tying in with what Luca was saying, um, we saw a lot of increased mobility of high net worth individuals leaving France during, uh, in particular, during President Hollande's tenure. I think there was a real, there was a real concern amongst the high net worth community about rising tax rates. So beyond that, and, and political volatility can definitely be a push factor. And, and sometimes that can be very stark. I, I went to a conference a few years ago and I was very, very surprised to see a, a Mexican lawyer with a, with a slide um, where he, uh, he had um, a graph showing kidnappings in Mexico City. And that is just, it's just so far from our, you know, it's not something we think about in, in Europe, but there are parts of the world where clients leave because they're concerned about security or, or volatility. Um, to some extent, we're seeing that in the UK at the moment. There's there's quite a lot of talk about people potentially coming from Hong Kong to the UK if the political situation continues to be difficult for, for some people there. Um, we also see um, clients naturally wanting to diversify their asset holding structures across multiple jurisdictions um, with a real focus on jurisdictions which are known for uh, established legal structures and rule of law and strong asset protection rules. And so we find that can be a driver of movement between jurisdictions because clients may set up structures and they, they may eventually follow the structures. And then the, the last point I wanted to make here was very similar to a point that Luca makes just about this increased fashion almost for clients to move between jurisdictions. When, when I first started practicing, certainly within Europe, the options were very limited. You had Switzerland with the forfait regime, which I'll, I'll come on to discuss later. Um, you had the UK with the non-dom regime. Both of those regimes were not time limited at all. You could, you know, we had clients who lived in the UK for 20, 30, 40 years who were non-UK domicile. That regime was, is now limited to 15 years. And at the same time, we've seen a lot more jurisdictions bring in competitor regimes. So Italy now has a 15 year regime. We have the Beckham law in Spain, the non-habitual resident regime in, in Portugal. And there's a sense that there's increasing competition, but a lot of these regimes are time limited. And we see, clients moving around between jurisdictions to maximize and prolong the benefits of these time limited regimes. And as a result, there's perhaps less of a sense that clients are fixed in one jurisdiction and there's more movement between. And then just you know, looking at some of the pull factors, um, and again, this very much ties in with what Luca was saying. Um, we find that work and business opportunities you know, often will be at the top of clients' lists when it comes to choosing a jurisdiction to move to. Um, you know, London and New York have, have been traditional favourites, especially for people working in the finance industries. Um, it pains me to say it, but people don't come to London for the good weather or the good food. Um, it, they tend to, you know, it, it's, it's uh, like New York, it's, it's always been a centre for you know, certain industries. Um, I've seen clients recently inquiring about places like Amsterdam, for instance, which is not something I saw years ago, but I'm seeing more of that. So um, I think work and business opportunities will, will always be a, a, a key driver. Um, perceptions of quality of life is very important um, and that can work in favour of jurisdictions like, you know, for instance, Italy has been very attractive with, with my clients. Um, for some clients, Switzerland, very, very attractive as well. Um, quality of schools and universities is something we see and, and that, that can make, that can not only attract people to a jurisdiction, but we see clients 
staying in a jurisdiction because they move there with their families, their children start schools, they go to university there, and that can lead to, to clients really putting down roots in a particular jurisdiction, which is interesting to see. And, and, and that, that has traditionally favoured places like um, the US and the UK with good internationally uh, renowned universities. Um, we see family tradition, you know, we see some clients who, who um, have a family tradition of educating their children at a particular school in the US or, or the UK. Um, and we also see patterns based on language. So it, when, I, when I help Brazilian clients, I find quite often there's also a connection with Portugal, whether through applying for the non-habitual resident regime or having, having, having the ability at least to be resident in Portugal. Um, there, there, there are connections there based on language. And it's very interesting hearing uh, what Luca was saying about the effect of COVID-19 on these patterns, because I've found over the last year or so, much more movement between jurisdictions than, than I would have expected based on the limitations on travel. And the, the tr you know, transfers between jurisdictions have been much more resilient than I might have expected. Um, and I, I wonder whether actually that process might speed up purely from a tax perspective. Because, you know, one thing that hasn't been worked out yet, I think, is how governments are going to pay for a lot of the expenditure that has had to, has had to occur as a result of the pandemic. And there's a lot of talk about increases in tax rates in, in particular jurisdictions. So we could see those push those push factors um, become become particularly relevant. And, and the final thing I wanted to talk about in, in this section was just in relation to uh, to taxes, um, because I think when clients are thinking of moving between jurisdictions, um, obviously as a as a UK tax and estate planning lawyer, um, one of the key conversations we have with clients relates to tax, and. It's incredible how much diversity there is between jurisdictions in terms of their their tax regimes, and so you know there are there are lots of individual um, characteristics for clients to choose between, and I, I have a selection of them here. So, income tax is obviously very important. Rates vary significantly between jurisdictions, as does the the, the extent to which rates are progressive. One area where I think there's an enormous difference is inheritance taxes. So inheritance tax, for instance, in um, the UK, and I, th I think I'm right in saying in France as well, is a 40% tax, so you know, a really significant tax. Um, in Italy, my understanding is that the maximum rate of inheritance tax is 8%. So it's a, it's a, it's a much less concerning tax, and, and that can be very attractive for clients at a, at a particular stage of life. And the, the threat of a 40% tax on, on one's estate should not be underestimated. Um, capital gains, again, you know, there's an enormous diversity in the way capital gains are dealt with. Um, some jurisdictions have quite low rates. I mean, the UK, surprisingly, has a top rate normally of 20% at the moment, which is quite attractive. Switzerland has no capital gains tax. Some jurisdictions have much lower rates for long-term holdings. So, uh, again, there's a, there, there's a lot to choose between there. And, and within that, rules for tax and carried interest and um, profits from the investment management sector. Again, those rules vary, in, in my experience, very considerably between jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions will just tax carried interest as income, which can be very unattractive for participants. Some jurisdictions have regimes which essentially, you know, allow um, very, very favourable outcomes. And, you know, classically, the, the US has a very attractive regime. Um, leaving aside the kind of the core taxes, there's then the questions like forced airship versus testamentary freedom. In England, for example, we, we generally have almost complete testamentary freedom. And, and that can be really important. I, I'm helping a client at the moment move jurisdiction. He's leaving the UK and he um, doesn't want to leave assets to a descendant of his. And the jurisdiction that he's thinking of moving to would force him to do so. So you get into a very interesting question there where you're looking at different jurisdictions and, and, and trying, to, trying to make the best of that situation. And I, I think one thing that's often forgotten about but really important is the attitude of tax authorities and linked to that is disclosure requirements. I think there's a sense that tax authorities in some jurisdictions can be quite difficult to deal with and tax authorities in some jurisdictions are, are much more user friendly and easy to have a conversation with. Um, I, I have always found when helping clients move to Switzerland for example, um, clients seem to have a good, um, a good experience with the Swiss tax authorities. Now, if there, if there are any Swiss lawyers watching this, they might be thinking, well, that, that's because we make it look easy. And actually, um, it's, uh, it's not as easy as you might think. But, you know, I, I've always got the sense the Swiss tax authorities are easier to deal with. And there are some jurisdictions where, where clients of ours have um, a very different experience. And, and I think that that's, that's a factor that shouldn't be discounted. And, and really, which jurisdiction works best will depend on individual circumstances. So later on, I'm going to come on to a comparison of the, of the main jurisdictions we see. Um, and just try and explain which jurisdictions I see as being best for different categories of client. OK, 
Hey, thank you so much. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, together, uh, to get your perspective, it's uh, it's great. Uh, uh, now, let me um, uh, quickly go through uh, the list of the um, 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 of the items that um, a high net worth individual should consider when uh, moving internationally. Um, uh, the list is fairly long, so um, uh, and the arg and the issues are fairly complex. So I'm going to go through very quickly, and uh, if you have any questions, you can um, either email me or uh, just ask a question at the end of the of the panel. Um, so the first one is, uh, what are the arriving state? Visa requirements. Well, this is uh, kind of obvious, but uh, an obvious issue. But I'm only mentioning this because uh, uh, if other options are unavailable, some special tax regimes for new residents may have fast track investors visa. Uh, the second thing is giving up residency valid validly in the departing state. This is important for several reasons, including um, from service of process and other procedural legal purposes, uh, from tax purposes, uh, for instance, continuing tax filing obligations, exit taxes may apply, um, or sailing permits. Uh, in some cases, keeping uh, close family ties uh, and business ties to the departing state may hamper giving up uh, residency in a valid way. Um, and of course, income tax treaty treaties contain some uh, type uh, breaker rules in the event uh, uh, two states uh, claim uh, uh, residency at the same time. Um, uh, then, of course, acquiring residency validly in the arriving state. Uh, there are some tiny issues here if arriving, for instance, mid-year. Uh, uh, residency is retroactive from the beginning of the calendar year or not. Uh, then uh, there are some procedural issues. Uh, uh, some states uh, require registration with public offices. Um, and um, finally, some special tax regimes for new residents may have private uh, rulings available to make sure one acquires uh, residency in a valid way. Uh, so uh, then income taxes, of course. Uh, 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 what are the potential effective income tax rate in the departing and arriving states under consideration? Uh, relevant factors may include, as Richard have uh, uh, suggested before, the source of income, uh, foreign or domestic, the type of income, either ordinary capital gains, business income, passive income, wages, and so on. Uh, what are the impact of the preferred tax regimes uh, for new residents available in, uh, in the arriving state? Uh, do we have uh, either reduced rate or flat amounts? In Italy, for instance, we have uh, uh, both. We have uh, reduced rates. Uh, sorry, I um, um, missed up a little bit the the um, the slides. Uh, I was saying that in Italy we have uh, both reduced rate on uh, 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 primarily uh, domestic income that reduces the. Uh, uh, the effective rate to 12 and a half percent roughly and flat or flat amounts so uh, like um, in Italy we have a hundred thousand for um, uh, foreign um, income um, another consideration is uh, is the preferred income tax regime uh, expiring after a certain number of years are there any anti-avoidance rules and exceptions? So for instance, preferred tax regime may not apply to certain type of incomes, uh, capital gains for the first uh, year of residency. And this is an anti-avoidance rule typically. Um, other taxes, uh, are there any other taxes in the departing and arriving states under consideration? Wealth and patrimonial taxes, including property taxes. Income tax on capital gains realized on the sale of real estate, 
uh, as Richard mentioned, inheritance and gift taxes are extremely important uh, in motivating um, um, someone to relocate internationally. Uh, what are the tax rates? What are the thresholds and exemptions for certain types of assets? Uh, what is the location of the assets? Uh, there are also some uh, here and gift tax, international tax agreement that may help, not so much, but somewhat. Um, and then for uh, someone moving or relocating uh, for uh, work-related reasons, uh, uh, social security contributions. Uh, what are the requirements for being eligible for pension benefits? Can uh, a social security totalization agreement helping accumulating contributions and benefits. Uh, are contribution to tax deferred pension plans available? Uh, Pre-immigration tax planning. Once the decision is made to relocate in the chosen arriving state, can pre-immigration tax planning be beneficial? For instance, Shall a high net worth individual sell assets and realize capital gains or instead hold on to appreciated assets? Uh, shift location of assets for inheritance and gift tax purposes. For instance, uh, one could consider contributing assets or shares to an entity incorporated in the arriving state. Uh, but if he does that, uh, does this trigger capital gains in the departing state? And if so, how much? Uh, shall uh, he or she set up a trust uh, or shall uh, set up or liquidate uh, uh, foreign entities? So, so these are um, uh, questions. And, and, and of course, uh, you know, there are conflict of laws also. Uh, shall a high net worth individual review and revise his or her succession planning? Probably yes, because uh, one can generally choose the law of his uh, or her citizenship as the applicable law to his uh, or her succession. Uh, this is important because uh, unless chosen otherwise, the applicable law to the succession is generally the one where the deceased had his or residency at the time of, uh, of death. Um, application of mandatory fortiership rules. Um, uh, interesting that uh, uh, most civil law jurisdictions do have uh, fortiership rules, uh, whereas the uh, United States doesn't. Um, the UK, I understand from Richard, has very little of it. Um, are succession agreement uh, valid? Um, um, Another issue to consider is the validity and drafting requirements for wills. Are multiple wills, once for each jurisdiction, advisable, as some suggest? And then finally, divorce and separation issue, perhaps uh, um, uh, prenuptial agreements, applicable law, et cetera. Conclusion, many things to consider from a legal and tax standpoint. It is important to plan in advance, or however, particularly because there are so many variables to consider if there is a main driver for the relocation, one should probably not get discouraged from relatively minor issues. In, in addition, uh, most re international relocation, I, I wouldn't say most because I don't have facts, but you know, it could be a temporary. And so things, uh, things change, laws change. And so uh, if there is a main driver, that's okay. So thank you for your attention and uh, 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 at this point, I would uh, um, I would again um, move to um, um, uh, to uh, to look at Luca. Do you have some additional tips and advice from uh, the private banker perspective to a high net worth individual planning to relocate internationally? Uh, well, sure. Um... In particular, now I will spend some minutes uh, on two topics. Getting the best from advisors, for clients, obviously, and then some best practice that we have identified across our wealth advisor population net network around the globe in order to best serve our clients. So as you see on this page, 
uh, we defined uh, 10 helpful tips that can help clients to prepare in advance because uh, realizing uh, we had realized uh, that some preparation focus preparation can help the clients maximize the benefit from the time with attorneys and advisors the perspective that i will give you in the next five minutes obviously uh, will not enter into certain tax and legal details uh, as we have Richard and Stefano that are responding to this aspect. So looking to the 10 points, the first is about purposes and goals. We discover in certain situations, the client has intention to move, but has not yet clear why to move. Obviously, this is not often the case, but it can happen. And also this conversation with the banker and with the wealth advisor. So the preliminary conversation can help the client clarify at least the ranking of the goals. And the, the, what, what we discover is that tax, as, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I said before, is a key driver, but not the main driver. Moving on the, on the page, Citizens, uh, detailed citizenship and residency. No, sorry, Stefano, it's okay. On point two, it is important that the client um, has at hand a detailed diagram with citizenship and residency of each family members. Because the first question of attorneys and advisors is, where is the residence? In some in situation, there are four or five people, a family of four or five people moving. Not all are resident in the same uh, country. Then it is very important uh, for you, uh, for all attorneys and advisors to have an inventory of all, of all assets worldwide. Some clients have not this ready when they start conversation. Not always, obviously. There are certain clients who are very well prepared certain other clients that need some help a diagram structure detail, detailing all the vehicles through which the assets are held and you see obviously on 5.5 a pre-immigration planning that requires obviously good coordination uh, with advisor in destination country and in home country Obviously, there are other points that are all related to this key concept. More, more you are prepared, more you have available, more clear information you have, better the attorney and the advisor will assist you. Obviously, this is important for us at JP Morgan because our main goal is also to, to get our clients fully satisfied. Also, in this situation, because you know, typically we, we, we provide the client with some referrals. It is surprising that certain clients who are full try net working people, when it comes to moving to another country, ask a fresh new uh, advisor. Meaning, I am assisted in my own country by a very reputable uh, big tax and legal firm. But I ask you, wealth advisor, to give to give me destination country advice because you because you know the country where i'm moving to so initially we had expected that the clients already have so many advisors but in reality in many situations they ask us referral referrals can you refer two or three advisor in your destination country and so what we do is prepare the client to get the best from those advisors Obviously, the other, other points in the helpful tips that I'm, I'm, uh, I dropped on, on this page is about investments. Uh, uh, obviously, at JP Morgan, we do not underestimate the importance of investments, and they take time to transfer and to liquidate, in particular, illiquid financial instruments. So an inventory of uh, investments which I would say rank from the most liquid to the more liquid is very helpful because from your experience, I am sure that many people in the audience knows that the, the tricky side is where it comes to illiquid investments 
rigid, rigid changes to vehicles uh, through which investments are held. And finally, when it comes to reviewing potential actions, decision, it is important for the client to, to, to answer this question. Is this a, question, a, a decision I can reverse? Do I have any flexibility? Unfortunately, when you relocate, not everything can so flexible. But what's important for the client is to, to know in advance that some decision have a certain degree of flexibility. You can change. For example, regarding a trust, maybe you are, you are reshaping the structure. But once you reshape caveat, it won't be easy to change back again to a trust. So it is important that the client knows in advance the decisions that are binding his decision spectrum in future, while there are decisions which are flexible. And eventually moving to the next page without entering into much details, because on taxation, obviously you see we, what, what we did out of our conversation, uh, you know, I'm part of, of a global, of a, a global vertical uh, uh, deepening of this topic. So uh, obviously what you see benefit of, of this global working group and their experience with many clients. So we tried in a way to have a practical dashboard to, to, to tell the client that what's important that you can group all the topics at least most of the topics in four sections. Marital and property regimes, will, trust, and successions, investments, and obviously taxation. A part of taxation that Stefano in particular has already deepened to a certain extent, and we spoke about it. Tax, consider the, tax, the impact of tax expectation and so on. Regarding the focusing on investments, obviously, the, the consideration are about, as I told you before, first that you need to understand whether you have or not, or not a bank who has an international footprint. Obviously better you have a bank with an international footprint, but you may also consider that your bank in certain situation cannot longer assist well as they used to assist because in the other country, in the destination country, the services may be different. This is sometimes underestimated. Another point which is underestimated is the investment regime. In certain countries, there are no limits or there are small limitations to investment choices that you have. When you move to European country or US or, or whatever, you should consider if you can do everything you were used to do in your origination country. This will impact the efficiency of the investment dialogue with your investment advisors. And eventually, one point I, I, I think deserves special attention is that the, the last point, some investment may not be adequate or tax efficient moving to another country. So the product A, the product B, could be even possible in the new country, but no longer efficient. To give you an example regarding Italy, my country, uh, certain offshore hedge funds are taxed at the highest levels, level, uh, highest rate. While in other countries, the, those are taxed at the standard rate. It is good that the client is made aware since the beginning that in case, in case, in case he, he will need to invest, he, 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 he would like to invest again in, in those, in those products, the, the tax regime, the new tax regime can be penalized. So the final message uh, again was cooperation, a lot of cooperation. The client get the best when he sees strong cooperation from bankers, investment manager, and advisor. And the second the disclosure, more you disclose to the country, uh, to, to the client uh, regarding the new country, limitation, pros and cons, more the client will appreciate. The client will never blame on us if we have disclosed properly what is going well and what is going 
less well in the in the new country. And Stefano, so far, I think these are these are the, the, the key point without entering too much into will, trust, and succession, that is obviously a point of main consideration for those clients that are in the particular stage of their life, uh, as Richard said, because certain country, and uh, surprisingly, Italy is our tax heaven in a way, be because of the very low tax rate uh, on a state uh, succession inheritance tax rate. Um, and eventually the last point, the most frequent question I got from clients, almost always, the first question is, Luca, do you think that the new regime will remain stable over time? The answer is yes, uh, because it is five years. Now the, 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 revenue, the revenue agency familiarized with the regime. We had 1,000 clients, ultra network individual relocated into the country in the last five years with only 30 cases challenged by so 3% of fails because the revenue agency a few years later challenged the situation. But the point is stability. In my perception, regardless the Italian uh, regime is the main uh, achievement those clients want. They want to move to a stable country. If this is a stable, then they consider other aspects. Stable also not changing frequently uh, the laws. I, I, have, I, have, I have finished, just, just it could be helpful. So I have added on page six some sources because, you know, we are an international bank privileged observatory on this, but we also rely on independent and public material in order to have to have our outlook, our our view about this phenomenon. I, I, I pointed out five, six, there are others, but I suggest uh, that who is uh, is willing to deepen the, the topic can can refer to those sources. Well, thank you very much, uh, Luca, for your very interesting uh, 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 presentation. Um, at, at this point, I would like and uh, uh, finally um, uh, ask uh, uh, Richard to highlight some of the most uh, common special tax regimes for new residents. I think this will be very interesting, and uh, uh, of course, uh, you know it's not going to be a detailed uh, presentation, but uh, you know it's uh, certainly helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to share my slides again so everyone can see them. Hopefully everyone can now see those, those slides. Right, so um, as Stefano said, I'm, I'm going to compare some, some common jurisdictions that, that um, clients move to and which we have ex experience of dealing with. Now, obviously it's, it's slightly uh, dangerous because I'm, I'm a UK tax lawyer. So when I talk about other jurisdictions regimes, it's entirely possible that um, people will have questions or comments. So please do jump in because we're, we're very much reliant for our experience of other regimes on, on, on working with professionals in, in those jurisdictions. So if anybody has, that does have any comments, please, please jump in and, and, and let me know. Um, here's just a list of the, the key jurisdictions I'm, I'm going to look at today. The UK, Ireland, Switzerland, Italy, Portugal and, and Spain are the main jurisdictions I'm, I'm going to talk about. And each of them has has its own its own regime, which is essentially designed to attract inbound individuals. Um, what I'm going to try and, and pull out of this is some of the key characteristics um, for clients to look at when they consider moving to a, a particular jurisdiction and, 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 and uh, registering under one of these regimes. Um, different regimes have different advantages. Um, and I just listed some of the key points here. So, you know, annual charges to make use of a regime um, applies in particular to Switzerland, the UK and, and Italy. Um, some jurisdictions regimes have employment restrictions uh, like Switzerland. Um, there may be complex rules to observe like uh, the remittance rules in the UK. And there are also um, uh, time limits to think about. So a number of different characteristics to, to consider. So I'm just going to start with a quick overview of the UK's uh, regime for, for non-UK domiciled individuals, which is which you may hear referred to as the remittance basis. Um, I won't go in, into detail on the UK's residence rules because I, I, I don't think that's 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 necessary for today's purposes. Um, it's worth just mentioning that nationality is, is normally not um, relevant from a UK 
perspective. Um, there, there are some situations in which nationality is relevant, but by and large, the key characteristic here is domicile. Um, domicile is one of those uh, characteristics which sometimes when we talk to lawyers in other jurisdictions, they think that maybe domicile is similar to a concept of, of habitual abode, um, but that that is normally not the case. It, it, the concept of domicile looks to much longer term intentions. And, and that, that's reflected in the, in the, in the maximum duration of our, of our regime in the UK. So um, an individual can move to the UK and if they are non-UK domiciled, they can claim the benefit of the remittance basis for, for 15 years of UK residence. So it's, it's quite a durable regime. It's quite a long-term um, benefit. And, and the key, as, I, as I'm sure uh, many people um, on this presentation will know, that the key advantage of the remittance basis is that although the individual pays full UK tax on UK source income and capital gains, uh, normally, and with some exceptions like employment income or um, income associated with certain types of, of, of life insurance policy, um, foreign source income and gains are not subject to tax in the UK unless remitted to the UK. And remitted has quite a, a complex definition designed to stop people making use of their non-UK income and gains in the UK, but fundamentally that's how the regime works. Um, there are annual charges to use the regime, but those charges don't apply until um, the individual has been resident in the UK for seven tax years. Um, and, and there are just a few practical considerations to think about. Um, claiming the remittance basis is quite easy. Taxpayers do it through their self-assessment tax returns. Um, there's no advanced ruling procedure. Uh, everything is done on a self-assessment basis. Um, Pre-arrival planning is, however, very important. So it's very important that clients think about how they structure their assets before moving to the UK, if they want to rely on this regime. And just, just trying to, I guess, isolate the key advantages and disadvantages of the regime. Um, there's a 15 year time limit, which is generous compared to some jurisdictions, but less generous compared to, to others. Um, the regime is quite complex to operate. The remittance rules are complicated, certainly compared to, for example, Italy's regime, which, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, immigration for certain clients is a bit more complicated than it used to be because of Brexit. So, you know, until uh, until recently, uh, clients moving from the EU could move to the UK and, and benefited from, from free movement. Um, that's no longer the case. And, and, and so the, the immigration position has become a bit more a bit more complicated. But key advantages, the regime is quite cheap to use compared to some other jurisdictions. Uh, it's relatively stable. There were, there were changes in 2017, but I, th I think it's pretty stable. Um, the UK uh, recognises trusts, obviously, and, and, and the regime is, I, I would say, quite simple to use for trusts and, and, and corporate structures. And one other point that I think people often lose sight of is individuals can choose whether to claim the remittance basis on a year by year basis. You don't have to make a decision that covers a, a longer period. You can, you can make the decision year by year. So it's quite a flexible regime in that sense. Um, Ireland, I, I won't spend much time talking about Ireland. Um, I, I have uh, had clients in the past move to Ireland. It's probably a jurisdiction I, I see people move to um, uh, slightly less. And I, I think that's just a, a question of you know, what, I, what matters I've had the luck to be in, in, involved in. Um, I, I think Ireland's regime is in, in many respects quite similar to the UK's regime in the sense that it, it's based around the concept of domicile and the remittance basis. And so I think many of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of Ireland are quite similar to the UK. I think I'm right in saying there's no charge in Ireland. And I'd be interested to know whether um, anybody on this presentation has any comments on that. But my understanding is that there's no charge to use the regime. Um, one potential downside is, is my understanding is that Irish capital acquisitions tax is something to watch out for for individuals who become resident in Ireland for more than five years. So individuals receiving inheritances or gifts can potentially become subject to that regime, which is something to watch out for. The next regime uh, I wanted to briefly talk about is, is um, the Swiss forfeit regime, the, the lump sum option. Um, I'm sure, again, many, many people will be familiar with this regime, and it, it involves individuals paying uh, tax on an annual basis on a, essentially a notional amount, which is, which is calculated with reference to various categories, um, annual living expenses, annual rental value of Swiss property, income from Swiss uh, sources, and a minimum tax basis for the relevant canton. Um, one really important um, factor in Switzerland is that um, my understanding is clients resident in Switzerland on a forfait basis are not uh, are not allowed to work in Switzerland, or, or certainly not on a consistent basis. And so um, that's you know that that makes the regime very suitable for some clients and slightly more difficult for, for some other clients. 
And I think compared to some other regimes, the, 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 the Swiss uh, forfeit regime can be uh, relatively expensive to make, to make use of. Um, my understanding is that the, the, the minimum notional tax basis under the lump sum regime normally is, is, is at least 400,000 Swiss francs a year. And, and my understanding is that tax is, is then paid on, on that resulting basis figure. Um, and, and my experience of helping clients um, interact with Swiss lawyers is that um, advanced rulings from cantonal tax authorities are, are common. Um, and, and indeed advised, and that the Swiss tax authorities, as I said earlier, are, are, are very easy to interact with, you know, very, very eff effective. And um, uh, so that's been my experience there. Um, in, in terms of uh, major advantages, then, I, I would say, you know, the regime is viewed as stable. I, th I think I'm right in saying some cantons have recently got rid of their forfeit arrangements. I think there was a referendum at federal level uh, on whether to continue forfeit arrangements more generally, and, and, and there was a vote to retain them. So I think the regime is seen as is seen as stable where it is available, um, um, but on the other hand, there's there's the question of work. So if, if if clients need to be able to work, I think the the Swiss regime is is arguably uh, or, or maybe less helpful. Now next, this is this is uh, this is dangerous because I'm going to be talking about the Italian regime with some Italian lawyers on the presentation. So I'm sure I'm sure Stefano will jump in and correct me if he uh, if he has any comments on um, on my summary of Italy's regime, but. Italy's regime is something that is one that I've seen a number of clients uh, interested in. Um, it's a it's a 15 year regime. Um, there are some uh, conditions based on residence in in in, in the 10 tax years before uh, the individual seeks to claim the benefit of the regime. Um, where the regime is available, the individual pays a, essentially a substitute tax. So it's a, it's 100,000 euros uh, per year with uh, additional amounts of 25,000 euros for additional family members. Um, and where, where the regime is available, non-Italian source income and capital gains, uh, my understanding is, uh, will normally not be subject to Italian tax. Um, and there, there are two important things to say there. Um, one is that um, my understanding is that there's a, there's a special rule within the first five years of Italian residence for capital gains realised on the disposal of substantial shareholdings which is an important thing to watch out for, especially for clients who have got, you know, for instance, business interests, which they wish to dispose of shortly after arriving in Italy. Um, statement status of trust is, is important. I mean, often as, a, as an English lawyer, we find that clients have trust as part of their wealth holding structures. Um, my experience of helping clients move to Italy is that Italy um, Italy does, does tend to recognise trusts and it's, it's, it's possible to explain trust arrangements to the, to the Italian tax authorities and, and, and reach a sensible position. Um, and another thing worth mentioning is, um, is that my understanding is that Italy also has a, a, a parallel regime for workers moving to Italy and, and reduced taxes for, for people who move to Italy to work. And therefore, um, you know, Italy has multiple regimes which are, which are designed to make Italy attractive to, to people who want to move there. And I think that the lack of a remittance concept is, is very important. I think um, in some ways as a, in, in some ways Italy has chosen the best parts of other regimes in, in, in creating this new regime. And I think that the lack of a remittance concept, I think for a lot of clients makes the Italian regime a little bit more a little bit more easy to operate. So the, the, the final two regimes I, want, I wanted to talk about in a, in a bit of detail are, are Portugal and Spain. Um, Portugal has the non-habitual residence tax regime, and, and um, one important, uh, I mean, first of all, the regime is limited to 10 years, um, and where, where the regime applies, it works in a slightly different way, uh, I understand, to regimes in other European countries, in the sense that non-Portuguese source income and gains are not automatically outside the scope of Portuguese tax. Um, my understanding from working with, with Portuguese lawyers is that non-Portuguese income and capital gains will be exempted from Portuguese tax, um, only depending on how the income and gains are treated for double taxation treaty purposes. So if the amounts are effectively taxed in, a, in, a, in another jurisdiction, then Portugal may, may give an exemption. Uh, but if not, then Portuguese tax may apply. And also Portugal has a, has a, a, a blacklist for jurisdictions. So if, if you have a client who has you know, BVI holding structures or they have, they have um, Trusts set up in the in the in, in in the jurisdictions which people commonly use to set up trusts um, that may introduce complications with with the Portuguese regime, um, but but where it applies, certainly my sense is that clients clients find it very attractive. 
and and the final regime just just to mention this section is the um is is, is the spanish regime the so-called the so-called so beckham law for uh foreigners working on assignment in in spain um i understand that regime is limited to six years um where it applies there's a special flat tax rate which is lower than uh, usual spanish tax rates for um uh, employment income um and non-spanish source income and capital gains Will generally be exempt from from Spanish tax, is my understanding, which which makes the regime attractive. Um, one important point to note is that in many ways this regime is is almost the opposite of the Swiss Swiss regime. Whereas under the Swiss regime, um, you can uh, you can uh, move to Switzerland but can't work or, or can't work in in, in a substantive way. Um, the Spanish regime regime requires the opposite. It, it is aimed at people moving to Spain with the intention of working there, um, and that's just an that's an important point to consider. Um, and those, those are the only jurisdictions I wanted to go into in detail. Um, someone raised a question earlier in the, in the chat um, section about whether Belgium is an attractive jurisdiction. And funnily enough, I, I have seen a client um, move to Belgium um, for a period. And my, my experience is that Belgium can be quite attractive. I think I'm right in saying that Belgium has its own special regime for, for inbound workers. Um, and there are a number of jurisdictions which I haven't mentioned here, like for instance, the Netherlands, which I think has the 30% the ruling regime which again is, is aimed at uh, individuals moving to the Netherlands for work, but, but, can, provide, um, but uh, can provide a great result for some, for some clients. Um, the US, I, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a specific regime designed to lure people to the US, but nevertheless, you know, many clients inevitably want to, want to move to the US and, 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 um, and there are attractions to the regime there. And I, I haven't covered jurisdictions like Cyprus and Malta, but um, you know, they, they have, a, they have a, a sort of special place and um, they have their own regimes, which I, I you know, uh, can be quite attractive. So that is, um, those are the main regimes I wanted to cover, Stefano and Luca, so I'll, I'll hand right. back to you. Well, thank you, that's uh, very interesting. Um, I uh, don't know whether we have other uh, questions. I think you answered the uh, Belgian question that we had from uh, one of the panel. Um, uh, there's another question, whether there is any political indication as to the likely survival of the Italian flat tax regime. Also any news on inheritance taxes or, okay, well, uh, I don't know about uh, you, Luca, if you have information, but I think that it, uh, the, uh, the, 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 if, I haven't heard anything that the Italian uh, flat tax regime were going to uh, be repealed anytime soon. I haven't heard anything. Uh, there are some um, um, discussion about uh, inheritance taxes, but uh, nothing really has been done and I don't think is a priority right now. Uh, I mean, there are some voices that would like to uh, increase that, but um, I don't think that- I don't uh, think, Stefan, I, I agree with you. I don't video. think there are particularly um, uh, strong voices at this moment. No. So, no. Um, well, on the, uh, my reply in this case is that my personal opinion, so not the first opinion, but I haven't heard anything that um, tries to think about changes in the flat tax regime. Else, I, I heard that in, in internal revenue services from their responses to rulings and so on are now very familiar with the regime. For example, on the BVIs. On the BVIs, initially, there were some concerns. Now, the, 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 the rulings are pretty much consistent in accepting those as a standard international vehicle for clients that are relocated to Italy. On the second question, which is more, more complex, well, on a long-term perspective, uh, no, nobody can bet that the, 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 the tax on inheritance tax will remain so low as it is now, which is maximum aid, but I, I'm not sure. This is not the priority for the next two or three years uh, to change this. Okay, and with that, I thank uh, everybody for participating. It's been uh, uh, quite interesting and uh, thank you so much. And again, um, uh, uh, feel free to drop us an email if you have additional questions. Thanks again to everybody. Bye. Bye.